severed and taken up the road. He was the monster. Welcome. You are entering the minds of psychopaths, darkness, and pure evil. Welcome to the podcast, The Monster Behind the Mask. Real people, real crimes, real victims, real monsters. And the atrocious crimes I've committed is continued as the Central County is a monster. I brought the community. My family, the victims, dishonor. And there's no, and it's all self-centered, as a, what you could call, I would call a sexual predator. Today is my final judgment, final judgment, final judgment. How's everybody doing tonight? I'd like to welcome you to the True Crime Podcast, The Monster Behind the Mask. I'm your host, my name is Ben. This is my first episode, first podcast. Uh, I love podcasts, that's why I'm doing it. I don't claim to know what I'm doing. Uh, I just really like true crime and wanted to do one myself. This episode, I'm going to be covering the infamous serial killer, Dennis Rader, or BTK. It'll be a two-part episode. First part, I'll cover the cases and the murders. Second episode, I'll cover his communication with police, how he gets caught, um, his sentencing, and stuff like that. Before we start, I want to give a warning of the graphic nature. It's extremely violent, gruesome. If you are around your children or any children, you should probably hold off on listening. Thank you. And with that being said, let's start the show. This nightmare starts in 1974 in Wichita, Kansas, a place where It's supposed to be safe to raise a family, but soon the evil of one man would shock this community to the core with terror. So the first victims, the Otero family, dad, mom, son, age 9, daughter, age 11, were found murdered in their home on January 15, 1974. Three children, age 15, 15, and 13, were not home at the time of the murder. Now I'm going to tell you how this happened. So Dennis Rader was trolling, as he called it, when he saw Julie Ontario leaving to take her children to school. He fixated on the mother and young 11-year-old daughter, Josephine, or they called her Josie. Now, fast forward two months, and fueled by his obsession of bondage, Rader set out to live out his perverted sexual fantasies. He prepared for his attack, on the mother and daughter by filling his Air Force parka with bindings and weapons, which included a handgun and rope. He hadn't planned on the father Joseph or young nine-year-old Joey to be home at the time. As Raider nervously waited to enter the home, he cut the phone line and was actually about to leave when young Joey opened the back door to let the family dog inside. That's when Raider entered the home as the family was making sandwiches in the kitchen. He entered, and while holding the family at gunpoint, told them he was a wanted man from California and just needed food, water, money, and transportation. He would later say it was a ruse to kind of calm them down. The father thought it was even a joke, stating, did my brother send you? After ordering the family to the bedroom and having them lie on the floor, still at gunpoint, he assured he would not harm them if they cooperated. Raider tied the family. With Joseph and Joey on the floor, and placed Julie and Josie on the bed. Raider even loosened the restraints when the family complained. He was later quoted saying, I'm not a bad guy, yet bullshit. I care for people. I tried to make them as comfortable as possible. But when Raider realized he was not wearing a mask, he made the decision to strangle them. Or in his words, put them down. The father and the mother had their hands and feet bound. Raider placed a plastic bag over Joseph's head and tightened a cord. He then strangled Julie. Raider, later recounting the horror, says, I had never strangled anybody before, so I really didn't know how much pressure you have to put on a person or for how long it would take. I strangled Mrs. Otero till she went down, passed out, and I thought she was dead. I strangled Josephine, and she passed out. 
I thought she was dead, and I went over and put a bag over Junior's head. Now, obviously, the murder's horrible, but what breaks my heart children having to watch their parents be murdered by this fucking animal. Then Raider looked over, and Joseph had chewed a hole through his bag. So we put a second bag over his head and tightened it. Raider then placed two t-shirts and another plastic bag over Joey's head so he could not chew through his. Raider states, Miss Otero woke back up and she was pretty upset. You think, asshole? She asked me to save her son, so I had actually taken the bag off. She screamed, you killed my boy, you killed my son. And she actually said, God have mercy on your soul. So I put her down, permanently. I strangled her, and it finally killed her. The children screamed as they watched their parents being murdered. Raider goes on to say, It was just something I had to do. Once I started, I knew I had to do all four of them. With both parents dead, Raider brought a chair in the room so the piece of shit could sit and watch as Joey thrashed around, slowly suffocating to death. Josie screamed, what did you do to my mommy? And asked what's going to happen to me. Raider replied, you're going to be in heaven with your family. And just another warning guys on the graphic and violent things that I'm about to talk about. It's really rough to listen to. And again, if you're with children, uh, turn it off. Listen to it a different time. I appreciate you listening, but not in front of your children. Thanks. Okay. So then Raider takes the little 11-year-old girl down to the basement. He had prepared a noose with a rope hung from a pipe. He watched her struggle for her life until she was dead. Raider pulled down her pants and underwear for what he calls a sexual release. Police would later find traces of semen close to the body. That semen would be the DNA evidence that would 30 years later force Dennis Raider into a guilty plea. With all four family members dead, Raider went from room to room trying to clean up the crime scene. He then left through the front door and drove the Otero's family car to a location closer to his own vehicle. Later that day, two of the remaining children, 15-year-old Charlie and 13-year-old Carmen, returned home from school, entering through the back door. The children walked into a gruesome nightmare that would be with them for the rest of their lives. Raider would later say he believed the victims would serve him in the afterlife. Once Dennis Raider had a taste for murder, it was going to be a long time before he stopped. In April of 1974, Raider would strike again. So after the Otero family murders, three different people tried confessing to the crime for whatever reason. And in October 1974, Raider called the Wichita Eagle Beacon newspaper, claiming he killed the family. He told them he left a letter at the public library in a mechanical engineering book. I won't read the entire letter, but it starts with, I write this letter to you for the sake of the taxpayer, as well as your time. Those three dudes you have in custody are just talking to get publicity for the Otero murders. They know nothing at all. I did it by myself and no one helped. So he also ended the letter with yours truly guilty. P.S. Since sex criminals do not change their M.O. or by nature cannot do so, I will not change mine. The code words for me will be bind them, torture them, kill them. B.T.K. You'll see it again. They will be on the next victim. So that's his communication and... That's the Otero family murder. The next murder is Catherine Bright. Raider claims he first saw 21-year-old Catherine Bright as her and a friend walked into her house. He says he watched her many times before as he trolled. He referred to stalking as trolling and often referred to his victims as projects. He called Catherine Bright Project Lights Out. On April 4th, 1974, Raider busted through Catherine's screen door wearing a stocking mask and carrying a magnum and a 22 pistol, but was stunned when he found 5 foot 6 inch 19 year old brother Kevin with her. Raider later states, I had no idea she even had a brother. 
Raider knew if he was to fulfill his sexual fantasies with Catherine, he needed to do something about her brother. He told the two he was wanted in California and just needed a vehicle to flee. He first made Kevin tie Catherine up, then tied Kevin, but both were able to free themselves. So Raider tied Kevin for a second time to a bedpost in one of the bedrooms and took Catherine to a separate bedroom and tied her down. Raider then went to strangle Kevin, but as he did, the brother broke his restraints and jumped up. Raider then pulled his 22 caliber pistol and shot him in the head. Raider later recounts, I hit him in the head, he fell over, and I could see the blood. So as far as I was concerned, I thought he was down and out. So that's when Raider went into the second bedroom and started to strangle Catherine. But Catherine put up a strong fight. Raider said she fought like a hellcat. Thinking she was dead, Raider heard noises coming from Kevin in the other bedroom. While attempting to strangle Kevin for a second time, Raider worried he would grab his magnum. So he took out his 22 and again fired and again hit Kevin. And for a second time, he believed Kevin was dead. Raider returned to finish off Catherine who was still fighting back hard. And unable to strangle her to death, Raider stabbed her in the back and under her ribs and left her for dead. Raider went to check on Kevin, expecting to find him dead. To his surprise, Kevin was not there. Kevin had gotten out of the house and was now running down the street. Raider quickly cleaned up the crime scene and left, running four to five blocks to Wichita State University where his car was parked. Unbelievably, Kevin would survive this attack. It's incredible. Bleeding, Catherine crawled to her living room phone and called the police, telling them she did not know her attacker. Catherine Bright, age 21, would die from her numerous stab wounds. 30 years later, when Dennis Rader was arrested, the Boy Scout knife he used to murder Catherine Bright would be found still in his kitchen pantry. Police would have trouble linking the Otero family murders with Catherine Bright's murder because it seemed the M.O. was so different. It would be almost three years before this savage killer would strike again. But on March 17, 1977, the horror continued. So that's the murder of BTK's fifth victim, Catherine Bright. His next victim would be 24-year-old Shirley Vane. Shirley Vane Relford was a 24-year-old loving mother of three children when she was brutally attacked by this monster. Raider would later admit Shirley was not his intended victim on March 17, 1977. He was trolling for a different target, in his words. But when that target was not home, he started just going through the neighborhood searching for another victim. He recounts, I was all keyed up so I just started going through the neighborhood. Raider approached a little five-year-old boy, returning home from the store with soup he had bought for his sick mother. Raider pretended he was looking for someone and asked the boy to ID a photo. The picture he showed the boy was actually that of his own infant son. Then he followed the boy to his house. He said, I watched where he went. I went to the house the boy went in. I knocked on the door and told the boy I was a private detective. When Raider entered the home, he turned off the TV, closed the blinds, and pulled out a 357 Magnum. As the boy was obviously scared, the mother appeared coming out of the bedroom and begged the man not to harm her children. I'm not going to, he says. And at gunpoint, he says, I told her I had a problem with sexual fantasies and that I was going to tie her and her three children up. Raider then needs the mother's help tying up the children and put them in the bathroom. He put toys and blankets in the bathroom as well. The mother pleaded with her kids to stay in the bathroom, hoping it would save them from this monster, and they did. Shirley vomited as Raider tied her up, so he brought her a glass of water and says he comforted her before he finished tying her feet and hands to her bedposts. When secured to her bed, Raider looped a piece of rope around her neck, 
placed a plastic bag over her head, and then strangled her. The children banged and screamed as their mother was being murdered. He planned on killing them just as he had the Otero family. But the oldest child was threatening to go get help when Raider says to them, I'll shoot you and I'll blow your heads off. After Shirley was dead, Raider laid her on the bed and taped her feet and ankles and tied her up with her arms crossed. Now guys, you gotta remember, Raider liked to murder, of course, but it was more the control and bondage I think he really got off on. I mean, he went, he went years between his kills and the pictures of his victims tied up, even pictures of himself tied up in disgusting poses with women's underwear. Um, that's what got him off. That's what he liked the best. Now, a ringing telephone interrupted Raider's sexual fantasies, as well as killing the three children, saving their lives. So instead, he put the plastic bag back over Shirley's head and tied it with a pink nightgown. He quickly gathered his things, stole a pair of Shirley's panties, as he did with several of his kills, and he left in his own car. Raider would admit to wearing the women's underwear he stole from his victims, getting off on reliving his crimes. The children would unsuccessfully attempt escaping by breaking the bathroom window. By the time they got out through the door, Raider was gone, but their mother was dead. Shirley's son Stephen gave the police an accurate description of their mother's attacker, but police at the time weren't confident the child was a reliable witness. Years later, seeing and hearing Dennis Rader during his court appearance, Stephen would say Rader is definitely BTK. Rader would write poetry about Shirley, based off the nursery rhyme Curly Locks. He titled his poem, Shirley Locks. On a card made from an index card and a child's printing set, Rader sent and was received by the Wichita Eagle Beacon on January 31, 1978. Again, Dennis Rader thought Shirley and his other victims would serve him in the afterlife. Before 1977 was over, Dennis Rader, BTK, would kill again. So that was Shirley, Rader's sixth victim. The next horrible chapter in this sad story came on December 8, 1977, and the victim would be Nancy Fox a 25-year-old smart and hard-working young woman. Now Raider's previous three attacks did not go as he had planned or as he had fantasized they would go. This type of serial killer fantasizes over and over, committing the perfect crime in his mind before he actually ever commits the murder or murders. But this next attack, Dennis Raider would proclaim he was most proud of. In his own words, he dubbed this Project Fox Hunt. Raider noticed Nancy one day going into her home and marked her as his next victim. He stalked her for a long period of time. He obtained her name from her mailbox. Once he felt he knew enough about his victim, he would select a date and a time to carry out the attack. On December 8, 1977, he parked a few blocks away, walked to her house, and knocked on her door. When no one answered, he cut her phone line before breaking in and waiting for her to arrive in the kitchen. When she arrived, he quickly gained control. Raider told her he was going to tie her up for sex due to a sexual problem. In the process, she calls his sexual fantasies ridiculous and tried to hurt him by clawing at his testicles. But with this piece of shit, it only aroused him more. So this is a statement Raider would later make, quote, This was what I would call a perfect hit. Although she gave me a lot of verbal static, she cooperated. She didn't fight me. I had complete control of her. That's why it was one of the more, the more, uh, enjoyable kills, as I call them, unquote. In his sexual fantasies, the use of bondage symbolizes control, and that's what Dennis Raider lusted for. And by tying someone up and strangling them, playing God, that's the ultimate control. 
Raider and Nancy Fox talked and smoked a cigarette as he searched her purse. Under the false understanding he was only going to rape her, she said she wanted him to, quote, just get it over with. She asked to use the bathroom, and he allowed her to, but told her to be undressed when she came out. When she did come out, he slapped a pair of handcuffs on her. He then laid her on the bed to tie her up, got on top of her with his own belt, and started to strangle her. When she was close to death, he let up pressure so she could gasp for air. His words, quote, I had her come back, and I whispered in her ear a little bit. I told her I was BTK, that I was a bad guy. He said she really squirmed at that point, so we pulled and put the pressure down on her. Raider did not have sexual relations with her, but as she died, the sick bastard masturbated. When she was dead, he took a few personal items as souvenirs and cleaned up the crime scene. Then Raider himself called the emergency communications department to take credit for the murder. He referred to it as his seventh victim. The call was recorded to an automatic taping system and was tracked to a phone booth, but the call only lasted seconds. On this call, he is heard saying, yes, you will find a homicide at 843 South Pershing, Nancy Fox. The operator repeated the address and the caller responds with, that is correct, before disconnecting from the line. The quality of the call is poor and was not released to the public until August 1979. The tape was sent to Washington, D.C., to the FBI laboratory. But the call was too brief and too distorted by background noise to make a comparison voice print. Nancy Fox was found murdered on December 9, 1977. Raider wrote two poems about Nancy. In taunting the police, he sent a dark-haired doll wearing makeup. The doll's arms were bound behind its back with pantyhose and its head was covered with a plastic bag. Next to it was a photocopy of Nancy Fox's driver's license. Dennis Rader was obsessed with seeing his crimes in the paper and on the news. He got off on it. He enjoyed taunting the police, while the public was terrified, wondering who would be next. As I said before, this was the murder that came the closest to his twisted fantasies. This may be the reason it would be more than six years before BTK struck again. So, in 1978, Dennis Rader wrote a poem about Nancy. I'm not going to read it. I might read it in part two. I'm not sure. I'm going to go over, you know, the communications. Uh, it, the poem was titled, O Death to Nancy. And on January 31st, the Wichita Eagle received an envelope containing a poem printed using children's rubber stamp set. I'll just say this poem starts with, Shirley Locks, Shirley Locks, wilt thou be mine? So that was obviously a poem BTK wrote about Shirley Vane, his sixth victim. After receiving no attention from the newspaper of earlier letters he had sent, BTK contacted KAKE TV. Cake TV, in an attempt to get recognition. A two-page letter arrived on February 10th, 1978, and it would take credit for the murders of Shirley Vane and Nancy Fox in 1977. There was a reference to a victim number five, which is not identified in the letter, but was later proven to be Catherine Bright from 1974. Her brother Kevin survived that incident and BTK was reluctant to admit direct responsibility, apparently because there was a surviving witness. There is a reference to the hanging of Josephine Otero in the letter. This was the 11-year-old victim. I will read a few passages from this letter. Um, quote, I find the newspaper... Oh yeah, I'm going to uh, leave all the inconsistencies in it. I'm guessing he purposely, um, you know wrote it wrong in places. So, quote, I find the newspaper not writing about my poem on vain unamusing. A little paragraph would have enough. I know it not the media fault. The police chief, he keep things quiet. 
He doesn't let the public know there's a psycho running around loose strangling mostly women. There's seven in the ground. Who will be next? How many do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? And at the end, P.S. How about some name for me? It's time. Seven down and many more to go. I like the following. How about you? The BTK. Strangler. Wichita Strangler. Poetic Strangler. The Bondage. Strangler. Psycho. The Phantom. The Wichita Hangman. The Wichita Executioner. The Garot Phantom, the Asphyxiator, and then last, BTK. Jesus, this guy makes me sick. Uh, he's such a narcissist, obviously. He just craves the attention. And, um, yeah, I can't think of many worse people that have ever lived in this world than this guy. Well, anyways, so BTK continued to target continue to attack but this next story is a little different um, this is the victim that never showed up there is one BTK target that was very very lucky to be alive on April 28 1979 Raider had a target selected and after entering the home of a 63 year old Anna Williams and waiting for her to return gave up and left after the attempt failed, Raider sent a package to the media with personal items he had taken from Anna's home, along with a poem titled, Oh Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? Yeah, that's so creepy. Okay. Raider would later tell a psychologist, quote, There's a lot of lucky people out there, for different reasons. Either I didn't make it to the house, or they never came home." Unquote. After this failed attempt, BTK disappeared for a while. But April 27, 1985, almost six years to the day when Dennis Rader, AKA now known as BTK, set out to kill again. This time, his victim was Marine Hedge, a 53-year-old widow. A big difference from this attack in previous victims is Maureen was his neighbor. She had lived in the same neighborhood as Raider for 30 years. I guess it made it easier for him to watch her, learn her routine, stalk her, and he called this Project Cookie. And since it had been six years since his last attack, Raider was getting older, and being older, and less fit, he really felt like he had to plan this attack better, give himself an alibi. On April 27, 1985, his son had a Cub Scout camping trip, and Raider was to be one of the Cub Scout leaders, and he was going to be camping with the group. As twisted as it is, he sees this as the perfect alibi. When the scouts were asleep, Raider slips out of his tent drives to a local bowling alley to park his car. He then calls a taxi. He even gargles a few sips of beer so that the driver would just think he was a drunk and hopefully pay little attention to him. Raider had his hit kit inside his bowling bag. His hit kit was his murder tools, rope, tape, knife, gun, and anything else he felt he needed to commit his sick obsession. When the taxi was close enough for Raider to see that Maureen's car was in the driveway and not expecting her to be home so soon, he asked the driver to stop the car and let him out right there. With Maureen's 1976 Monte Carlo in the driveway, Raider assumed she was home. He cut the phone lines and quietly entered the home but as he went through the house, he soon realized she was not. But then he heard the door opening and hid in a bedroom closet. As he hid, he heard Maureen come in with a male friend. Her friend was there to visit, 
and did not leave until 1 a.m. After her friend was gone, Marine went to bed. Still in the closet, Raider waited until he was certain she was in bed and she was asleep. He crept out and turned on a bathroom light to see her better, and that awoke her. She screamed when she saw him, so he immediately jumped on her bed to strangle her, or as he said, quote, throttle her. When she was dead, he stripped off her clothes and placed her nude body on a blanket. As he went through her personal things, he contemplated how he was going to live out his twisted sexual fantasies. He would later say, quote, alive or dead, she was going to that church. After rummaging through her house, he took her wrapped up dead body to the trunk of her car, apparently already with a pre-planned destination. He drove her to the Christ Lutheran Church, where he had stashed plastic to tape over the windows. It, yeah, and on a side note, that this was the church that Dennis Rader attended with his family every Sunday. He was a church leader at this very church where he was bringing a dead body to live out a sexual fantasy. This is a glimpse into the mind of a monster. Once in the church, with the windows covered, Raider laid Marine on the altar and tied her dead body up in sexually graphic forms of bondage and took photographs with a Polaroid camera. After living out his perverted dreams inside this church, he placed her body back inside the car. After driving around for a while, looking for a place to dispose of her body, he buried her in a roadside culvert and laid branches and brush on top of her. Raider was then able to just slip back into the campsite as if nothing had happened. When Marine didn't show up at the coffee shop where she worked, her manager and co-workers became worried. This was out of character, not like Marine to just disappear. She was a great worker. So when the police locate her purse in a ditch on April 28, 1985, they feared the worst. Marine's car was found on May 2, 1985 police find a blanket and a bedspread in the trunk covered in weeds and mud. On May 5, 1985, the police discover the nude body of a female. Beside the body was a pair of pantyhose with multiple knots tied in them. It was Maureen. She was found seven miles from her home. So this crime scene was obviously a deviation from earlier BTK attacks and it being six years later, probably hard for the police to link it. Later, an autopsy confirmed she had been murdered. Cause of death, manual strangulation. Raider had killed again, and by killing someone that lived so close, it was like a badge of honor to him, a conquest. After the brutal murder, there was a rumor going around the neighborhood that the killer laid in wait behind Marine's hedges. So everyone in the street removed the hedges in front of their homes, except guess who? That's right, Dennis Rader. This was Rader's eighth victim, but he was not done. His next attack would come about a year and a half later. So Marine Hedges murdered at the hands of BTK. Eight victims, all along raising a family, being a leader in his church, while he's murdering people in that very church, that goes to show you there is evil in this world. Evil beyond anything our nightmares can give us. So I was going to go through all the murders in part one, but I'm actually going to cover the rest of the murders in part two, and I'm going to go through communications with the media, his communications with law enforcement, how he takes a 20 year break from murder only to resurface. I'm gonna go into how he is caught. I'm gonna play some audio of his interview. The guy goes into extreme detail explaining these crimes. He wore a mask of normalcy. Well, this is definitely a monster behind that mask. Okay, 
So that was part one of the two-part BTK episode. I hope you enjoyed listening. I will release part two sometime in the next week or two. This was definitely not my paying job, so balancing work, family, and the podcast research was kind of a challenge. Thank you for listening to my show. I really appreciate it. If you would like to contact me with comments, questions, or any suggestions about the show, feel free at my email address, monstersmask at gmail.com. Monstersmask at gmail.com. I would also like to give a thank you to Tyler Swisher for providing some of the music, and I would also like to thank my wife, Megan, for putting up with the research. I'm also working on some upcoming shows where I will be covering some cases from my home state. I've lived in two states, but was born and raised in Maine. As they say, the way life should be. It can be a vacation land, but it can also be a nightmare. I thought it would be interesting to cover some murders and unsolved cases from my home state, and two came to mind. I grew up within walking distance from a dirt path called Murder Road, and there's a story behind it. The Murder Road sign on my profile picture of this podcast is the actual road that I grew up near. Another case that came to mind, when I was a kid, when me and my sister were driving to my grandmother's house, she would always point out one of Nana's neighbors and say, that's the murder house. It always put scary thoughts and bad dreams in my head. So I'm going to tell the true story of a mother that was murdered in the early 90s and a killer that thought he got away with it for over 20 years. So that's it. That's the show. Hope you liked it. Hope you tune in for BTK Part 2.